the input companies played a very important part. And they identified uh, people who were interested in organic, and they went out at night and held meetings out around the country. Even two or three farmers, they would send somebody out and see if they could maybe convert them. And they also, this particular one, where I was a consultant to for a while, had a sort of a package to offer to organic farmers. Very much soil testing and advice and so forth, and helping them uh, identify markets as well. And the other thing, it was a problem for organic farmers to find out who each other were, because they were scattered all over. And the input companies, this one and others, would hold farm dinners in the wintertime and invite in all the organic farmers that they knew. Of course, they were selling products. But this is a way that organic farmers found out who each other were and exchanged information and became friends. And this was a very important uh, part of the movement. I'm going to touch on a couple of surveys. One, uh, it's kind of obvious, I think, the disappearance of wildlife on farms. Soil lacked life, as the organic farmers always said the health problems of livestock, and the adverse impact of chemicals on both livestock and, and on, on the family. A couple of more specific things here. Building the infrastructure, uh, farmer-operated, farmer-organized certifiers. The first ones were in 1972. Uh, the farmers that I worked with, um, most of them were not certified. They were self-certified, but everybody knew everybody. And as far as I never had any question about um, whether they were organic or not. Organic conferences, they were breaking out all over. Uh, I went to, I spoke at this conference that had, in 1978, 600 people. And there were many others across the Midwest, an incredible interest on the part of organic farmers to get together and to go and share information and, and, to, and to go to conferences. Organic farming newsletters for the Historical Society collection. I've got a whole lot of old newsletters that were put out by, by farmers in most cases that are organic newsletters, very historic, some really interesting stuff in them. And that was another way that they, that they, they kept in touch and shared information. Health food co-ops, of course, which I'm sure many of you know about, were very important at this period. Direct marketing. All the organic farmers that I visited wanted to direct market if they possibly could. And in many cases, they were direct marketing meat and usually sending it off to St. Louis or Chicago or someplace for someone that they had a relationship with and sent meat every year. And then the organic, uh, pioneer organic processors uh, like Walnut Acres, for example, which also did mail order. Uh, Earth's Best Baby Food was one of the early ones, and, there, and they were a number of those. So that the processors were starting to get in, involved in this as well. Outrageous attacks on organic. And uh, honestly, laughing at, at organic, and all of this sort of thing was going on in organic in, in rural communities around the country. Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture, was one of the most outrageous. You've probably heard this quote before. Um, which 50 million Americans are going to starve or be hungry if we switch to organic. There were cartoons like this that would show up so people could laugh at organic. And another one that, that I really uh, think was maybe a little funny as well, but there was John White, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, made a talk after Earl Butch did and said, if we're going to farm organic, we're going to have to have manure piles as high as the Empire State Building. So this sort of thing was going on constantly. But the organic farmers were sticking together. They knew they were right, and they just let it roll off. Then I did a survey myself of 550 organic farmers. I had this list. Uh, check and see what the barriers to adoption were. This was a very long survey. And one of the interesting things that, that came out of this was that only six of these farmers knew of any research going on at any land grant university. And actually, I then wrote to the deans of, of the land grants in these states and said, is this, is this true? And four of them wrote back and said, yeah, I can't really identify anything that we're doing here. And a fifth one wrote me a letter and said, not only are we not doing any, we're not going to do any. So that kind of 
uh, sized up that situation. And the other thing that was so wonderful about getting back these, these um, uh, paper forms was that farmers had written very nasty stuff about land grants, USDA, and uh, extension people up and down the margins. It was, it was just wonderful. <clears throat> so I guess I jumped ahead here for a little bit. So organic farmers received neither support nor respect. It was, disrespect was one of the key things here uh, from the agricultural establishment. And this changed with publication in the peer review at American Journal of Ag Economics of a report on a project that I was involved in as a member of a team that was headed by uh, environmentalist uh, Barry Commoner, who got a grant, not from USDA, but from the National Science Foundation to take a look at this. And it was a great study, uh, three years, a great report. And it showed that uh, we, we gathered a tremendous amount of data. So we were able to show that uh, far, organic farmers were making just as much money as conventional. They were using a third less energy, and this came at a time when energy was a big issue, and they had a lot less erosion. We did a lot of soil testing and so forth. And so, um, this was kind of a shock to USDA to see this in a peer-reviewed journal. So, Bob Berglin was the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, a Minnesota farmer, who had a neighbor who was a very successful organic farmer. And Bob was a very reasonable, wonderful farmer himself. And so he kept getting complaints about the fact that USDA wouldn't do anything. And so Bob just set up, just appointed a committee and said, we're going we're gonna to take a look at this. And maybe there's some things that the department could and should be doing to support uh, organic farming. And the, and the result was, yeah, um, a wonderful report. And all of those of you who are interested, it's, it's online, it's a PDF, and uh, you really should look at it. Uh, farmers wrote in, 20,000 of them, to get copies of the report. And about time that was happening, and, and also Bob had appointed a, a USDA organic coordinator, the new Reagan administration came in, ordered all of the reports destroyed, and fired the organic coordinator. So that was a turning point, and it was pretty much the pattern uh, for USDA. But Garth Youngberg, who had been the main author of this report, set up the uh, what later became the Wallace Institute, uh, put out a peer-reviewed journal, which is still in existence, and started a little newsletter, of which I was the editor. This is issue one, number one, and it says on there, ARS has kind words for organic, but no money. So that's the first story ever published in this newsletter. The newsletter uh, did, did very well. So Congress, with all of its courage, uh, when it was pressed to follow up on the 1980 very fine USDA report, um, had a, a very good bill introduced, but no interest, lots of resistance, and of course, very uh, heavy opposition from USDA. So eventually, this turned into sort of a low input agriculture thing, um, and all uh, references to organic were stripped out of, out of this legislation. That was not necessary, but it was done. And the program was, uh, became eventually uh, the SARA program. It was called LISA, Low Input Sustainable Ag, earlier. So this was a step, but, uh, and in my own uh, looking at um, SARA grants, which I did recently, about 15% of SARA grants even today go to organic, 85% not. 
A good thing that happened in the 80s was state legislatures, because organic farmers were lobbying directly with them, were very open. And they were not Im uh, impressed by uh, USDA when it came to organic. And by uh, 1990, 27 states had uh, statutes. Many of them became actually uh, certifiers and still are. Uh, they had research programs, cost share programs. And so there was a very nice working relationship with many of the states. And, and I remember when the Organic Foods Production Act came up at the hearings, the uh, uh, organization of state uh, commissioners of agriculture came in and gave a very strong testimony in support of, in support of organic. The other thing that happened in the 80s was that there were a lot of small state organic organizations. There were a lot of small certifiers, and they all got together in 1989 uh, in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, and formed an organization. And one reason they did this was because they heard that the organic industry was going to come to Congress with, with the Organic Foods Production Act, and they wanted to get themselves in a position to have some influence over this. So they formed this really good organization. They were able to hire a, an organic farmer from Oregon to come and be a lobbyist. And they were very influential in insisting that there be a National Organic Standards Board. Uh, the $5,000 certification exemption uh, came from there. Uh, the first round of cost of accreditation so that the certifiers would not have to uh, pay that. Uh, interest in uh, uh, cost share and so forth. So a lot of um, it was it was really interesting that this kind of a diverse group of little groups could come to the hill and have a real influence on the Organic Foods Production Act. Now we're lucky that they did. The organic community at that point really worked together because there was this interest in organic, and so there was there was the uh, the organic farmers and the certifiers. Uh, there were pioneer organic businesses that I've just mentioned, and there was an Organic Food Act working group of consumer, environmental, animal protection, faith-based, and other organizations, 27 of them. And uh, I had the, the privilege of being the co-chair of this 27 organization uh, coalition. We. Uh, and we had a very friendly relationship with the organic farmers. And we supported what the organic farmers and the certifiers wanted. And we had a little tension with some of the business people, but that's to be expected, I think. And I was the lead off witness on the Organic Foods Act when it came up in uh, the Senate, because I had been the co-chair of this, of this group. And we had distributed through health food stores around the country a petition asking Congress to do, an or to do national organic standards. And I presented to the committee those petitions, which had 136,000 names. Believe me, the senators really were excited to see pet petitions with that many names. And they were looking to see if the names were real and all. <laughs> 